gathering in. There are folks joining us online, so we will do our best to try to see if we can monitor those comments that are online as well. We do want to open up tonight and go to uh, the Lord in prayer. Uh, we would ask you to continue to prayer to, to continue to prayer, continue to pray for um, actually pray for Pastor Heather. She's been dealing with. Uh, some nausea and some some of the fun that comes along with having a baby on the way, and that's coming in waves. And uh, so you guys pray for her. Um, I've told her, you know, that uh, as I've told you all before, that I'm sure that she can almost, once she's gone through childbirth again, she'll almost be able to understand what it's like to be a man with a cold. But um, no, but be in prayer for her. Also, continue to pray for. Uh, Pastor Matt Gunner, that is Leah's father. He's going to be having surgery on Monday. And uh, they believe at this point his tests have come back. It seems like his cancer is isolated. So they believe they're going to be able to remove some of his colon and everything will be fine after that. So uh, they'll be doing some more testing to see if they need to do treatments. But I believe that uh, he'll be able to come out of that surgery and everything be great and good and not have to go through more treatment. So... I continue to pray for him. Do you have any other prayer requests tonight? Yes, ma'am. Let's remember them. Let's continue to. Yes, ma'am. Pray for Madison. She's still sick. Uh, let's pray for the Laboons. Let's continue to pray uh, for all the people dealing with COVID and those sicknesses. Uh, we pray for them. Um, let's pray um, today. Uh, you probably got an email today. Um, if you're not on the email list, you can go over to gardensanctuary.org and you can fill out a contact form there and just say, when you fill it out, just say that you want to be added to the list. We'll make sure we get you on the email list. Um, but I sent out an email this morning about today was oral arguments in the uh, Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health case uh, before the Supreme Court. And that is the, really the biggest opportunity that we've seen to push back on abortion uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, it would be the biggest blow to Roe versus Wade, depending on how it comes down in the last, well, since Roe versus Wade. So in 50 years, um, the arguments today uh, were, 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 seems like there's a, a good case for the fact that there was bad law in the beginning, and even people who were pro-abortion thought that Roe versus Wade was bad law. So let's pray that that uh, happens, and, and it'll just be, it won't ban abortion if the case goes the way we want it to go, but what it will do is allow states who have banned abortion for those laws to stand. And so that would be uh, a lot of states in the nation have laws in the book. South Carolina is one of them, but we have a heartbeat bill, uh, so at that point, instantly babies with a heartbeat in this state right now we can't enforce that law then we would be able to so uh, let's be in prayer that that goes well uh, if you're asking somebody you know I've had a few people ask how it went um, you won't hear anything about that until spring or summer about what they actually decide that's the way it works in that court there'll be oral arguments and it'll be months before we get a decision uh, but let's be in prayer about that we certainly need um, God to move uh, in that situation I do believe that we are in the generation now where we can see things change so let's pray that it does happen anybody else have a prayer request tonight yes ma'am hmm. let's remember that Remember that. Somebody else have a prayer request? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll pray for our Bible study tonight as well. Uh, before we do that, continue to pray that our uh, Buy a Tree, Change a Lot continues to go well. Change a life. Change a life. Buy a Tree, Change a Lot. Well, you would be changing a lot, a lot of lives. Pray that that continues to go well. If you've not noticed, we, trees are dwindling. The pile of trees is going down, and we are on our way to having the best year that we've ever had and buy a tree change a life and we are excited about that but we need you to come out and buy a tree some of you have come out and volunteered we thank you for that um, sometimes during the week you might come out and volunteer and not see but one or two people but on the weekends it can get it can get kind of busy but uh, 
we thank you for your help there and thank you for all of you that have given to that cause and we continue to pray that that goes well but let's pray father we thank you for this chance to be in your house lift up your name we pray lord that your hand would be upon us tonight that you would guide and touch lord we pray for every one of these situations every one of these needs lord you know every detail pray for those that are sick lord you'd move in their situation those lord in need lord of touch physically god those spiritually mentally emotionally financially lord we pray that you'd move in every one of these areas father we pray that your hand would be upon our time together tonight that you would anoint us lord we pray that lord we would be able lord to learn of you and we would leave this place closer to you than when we arrived father we'll thank you and praise you for what we know you're going to do for we ask it in the name of jesus amen Amen. All right, so we are uh, continuing our series of uh, strangest things, and there's been a few things that we have been able to cover in that. Um, before I do that, let me think if there's anything I need to tell you about immediately. Yes, there is. Uh, Christmas banquet, party, dinner, whatever you want to call it. Let me remind you of that before we get going. That is on the 12th. There is a sign-up sheet at guest services. And so here's what I need. I need your help because if you don't sign up, then I'll get in trouble with Miss Mary and Miss Alita, and I don't want to be in trouble with Miss Mary and Miss Alita. So you guys, if you would sign up, let us know if you're coming. Uh, we just ask each family bring a side dish, a drink, a dessert. The church will be providing the meats, and uh, it's always a good time. We do some gift giveaways and that sort of thing. It is a really fun evening. Um, so come out, and you want to be part of that. But please sign up as soon as possible. Uh, so we can have an accurate count of how many people are going to be here. I think that's the only thing I need to tell you about at this point. Parents' Night Out is also the 17th, uh, so that night you can drop your kids off, and we're going to uh, have our movie night and do some snacks and crafts and games, and it's going to be a great time, and you're going to come back, and you're going to pick up your kids, and you're going to look at me, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be wore out. I'm going to be glad you came and picked up your kids. I'm just kidding. I mean, actually, I'm not kidding. I'm going to be glad you picked them up, but that's, no. And I'll be wanting to give mine away to somebody else then too. So, All right, I think that's all I have to announce. Let's get into this. All right, strangest things. So we've been talking about a lot of things uh, through our strangest things series. A few things that we have learned in principle. We have learned that God created the universe with free will woven through the design. That God uses lesser beings to do his will. That God operates through designated authority figures. We've talked about the fact that we are God's imagers. That means today we saw... What's, that's one of the reasons today's case in the Supreme Court matters. We believe that human life is created in the image of God. So therefore, human life is valuable. That's important. We also understand that we are in e and an eternal supernatural battle. The battle lines have been drawn. We are in the middle of it. We understand that God, in the midst of that, is working his plan of redemption. Now... In the beginning, we know that God created all things, and at some point after creation, there was a war where? Where was their conflict? In heaven. And in this conflict in heaven, we had someone who decided they didn't like God's authority. Who is that someone? Satan, the one we call Satan, the accuser, right? He has this issue. He wants to be God. He wants to, be, he wants to rise up and be in God's position of authority, and so we know what happens he, what happens to him? He gets what? He gets booted out. He gets banished. Now, where does he wind up, it seems? Here. Here, right? He winds up here, and, and we discover that here on earth, God creates, God creates this garden. He creates this garden. God puts uh, these human beings in this garden, and he creates them as his imagers, and he gives them some specific orders. Does anybody remember the specific orders that God gave? Be fruitful, multiply, and then why does he want them to be fruitful and multiply? What's the big mission? Subdue the earth, right? Spread out, subdue the earth. That's God's big mission is for the garden to spread, his authority to be seen through his imagers across the entirety of the earth. The only way they're going to be able to do that, two people can't do it, they've got to multiply spread across the face of the earth. And so God gives this order, but someone comes along, which is who? Satan. Now Satan comes along. Now in, in the book of Genesis, he's called what? He's a serpent, right? Just we're told that this serpent is very subtle. 
but we discover that this serpent is indeed this one Satan when we look at what scripture? Where do we find that at? Does anybody remember? What book tells us? Revelation. When you go to the book of Revelation, you find out that it was indeed that one who's now called the dragon was the serpent from the beginning. So after that, there's a problem. God now has these two beings who have rebelled. And their rebellion is not, it's not about the fruit of a tree. What are they rebelling against? What's that? God and specifically God's what? His, his order for creation, God's structure, God's governmental authority. They're rebelling against God's plan. And so after they rebel, God says, I've got to separate them from what? What's he want to keep them away from? The tree of life. Why does he want to keep them away from the tree of life? They live forever. And someone who is evil or broken and twisted and knows good and evil and lives forever, they could do a lot of evil, couldn't they? And so God actually doesn't just say he kicks them out of the garden. He says specifically that this cherubim is sent to separate them, to keep them from, in the way to this tree of life. Now, we know that God in his mercy limits us from living forever in this brokenness and that there is redemption that works for us in eternity. But we also see, so God drives them out. Let's, we'll, go, we'll go from there. The fall of man on earth, God drives them out. Both of these rebellions now on heaven and on earth are against God's authority. Now, after God kicks them out, we, this is just our recap. We kind of started with this recap last week. Do things get better? Do they learn their lesson? No. How do things get worse, more sinful? We get to chapter what in the book of Genesis and things have gotten really bad. Anybody know? It's not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six. Oh, look at you. There you go. Chapter six. We get to chapter six of the book of Genesis and things are terrible. And God says, I wish I hadn't done what? Made man. So God says he's going to destroy man. And so when God decides to destroy man, he, he responds how? How does he destroy man? A flood. He saves a guy named Jonah, right? We know that story. Jonah gets off the ark. Jonah, I said Jonah, wow, look at me. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff, come on up and help me out. Keep my words straight. I got Jonah on the ark. I've got buy a tree, change a lot. I got a lot. Yeah. What are they? <laughs> Dan Hollinsworth, you told me that eggnog didn't have any of that stuff in it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, get that rumor started now, right? <laughs> it doesn't take much, does it? That's spoken like a true pastor's wife right there. No, so uh, Noah gets off the ark. Jonah is not on the scene yet. Noah gets off the ark. When Noah gets off the ark, God gives Noah some instructions. What's he tell him to do? Multiply, spread out. God tells him the same thing again. Multiply, spread out. What do they do instead? They build the Tower of Babel. And one of the things they say about building the Tower of Babel is they say, hey, we're going to stay in one spot. We're going to connect with the spiritual right here. And after that, God does what? How's God respond to this? He splits them up. But when he splits them up, how does he split them up? Does anybody remember? God does a mathematical equation to split them up. How's he split them? According to the number of what? According to the number of the sons of God. Now, who are these sons of God that we've talked about? They're these members of the divine council. They're these spiritual beings. God splits up the peoples of the earth based upon these spiritual beings. And we talked about this last time we were together before Thanksgiving, how now you begin to see territorial things. Now you begin to see you go into one region and you can feel spiritual oppression. You go into one place and it's the same types of crimes, the same types of poverty, the same types of things that happen there. It's why when you lay over evangelism, over maps of the world, you will see that some of the worst places in the world are places that are the darkest regarding the gospel. We began to see that these beings, these spiritual entities rule in places, but we don't just see this because we suppose it. 
Does anybody remember an example, a specific example in the scriptures that tell us of one of these sons of God or angels or whatever you might want to call them, principalities? Does anybody remember a place in the scripture where we saw them ruling? The prince of Persia. Where do we find that story at? Daniel. Daniel, I'm on my way. I was on my way to you. The angel says I was on my way to you, but I couldn't get here because I got in conflict with the prince of Persia. And he said that the only person who came to help me was Michael. Remember that? He says the only person who came to my side was Michael. Michael's fighting with you. He actually says Michael He refers to Michael as his prince, as Daniel's prince or Daniel's angel, if you will. He says, Michael has come to fight with me. And then he says, once I've I've dealt with the prince of Persia and I go away, then who might show up? You remember that? The prince of Greece, another territorial god, if you will. So we see this, and we talked about it some, about how there's places, for example, that will have uh, serious violence, how you go places. In fact, uh, I was talking with someone recently we were talking about spiritual warfare. And one of the things we mentioned, you'll remember I talked to you about how Nineveh was a bloody, violent city where they liked to behead people. Then we had this group called ISIS that came along, and ISIS made their headquarters in a place called Mosul, and Mosul is modern-day Nineveh. If you go to Mosul, modern-day Nineveh, when ISIS came up, what did they like to do? They liked to behead people. Why? Generations of people died, the spirits lived on. Those spirits inhabit generation after generation. That's not saying every person there. But I have spoken with people, again, and I, we won't go into too much detail tonight, uh, but, but I have spoken with people who have gone uh, with the United States military into different places, and they will tell you you can feel the spiritual oppression. Some of them have gone to Iraq, which Babylon, Nineveh, all these places. And they said it felt totally different than any other place on the globe that they went. This is a believer. Why, why do you have these feelings? Well, there's spiritual warfare. And we understand the idea of spiritual warfare, so we're going to move forward. We might come back and talk about a little bit of that in just a moment. But So God splits them up, but he doesn't just split the people. He basically, God basically says, hey, you want to do it your way? Let these other gods be your gods. Worship Baal. Worship Molech. Sacrifice your children. You're going to find out that I'm a better God than they are is what God says. You're going to find out that I'm better than all these other beings that you want to worship. But God also did something else. What did he do? He chose that for himself he was going to have what? What's that? He was going to have his people. And who were his people? What's that? The Israelites. We see it in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind talking about at Babel, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. There's that division between spiritual principalities. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So God starts working with a group of people, and with that group of people, God begins with a particular individual. What's his name? Abraham or Abram, right? And we, the Garden Sanctuary heard a lot about Abraham last year. We, we learned a lot about, about that family line. And here's the thing. God begins to work with him. You remember, does anybody remember where Abram was from? Er, right? Er, yeah. And so Abraham, and you remember actually one of those ziggurats, those pyramids that I showed you a picture of, was the ziggurat of Ur. He's from a pagan land. And so him coming out of this pagan land, it's interesting as well. You'll see a lot of these same things. We've talked about that with cigarettes. Another thing, uh, if you go into the Middle East, we hear about like worshiping around the black rock uh, with Islam. You'll see that with other religions where they'll have uh, pagan uh, meteorites that have fallen. They've made them, they make them a, a place of worship, things like that. A lot of things that are similar about these things, so it's not surprising that we see a ziggurat where Abram was. But God starts with this guy named Abram, and God says to him, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, most of us, and again, Garden Sanctuary should be really familiar with Abram, uh, are familiar with Abraham in verse 12. God tells him to go. Where does God tell him to go? Yeah, away, right? God says, go, go to the place where I'll show you, right? God tells him he's going to guide him. And so he, and he begins to make these promises to Abram. What kind of promises does he make Abram? He's going to have children, right? going to have a son. What else? 
to have land. What else does he tell them? He says, all the nations will be what? Everybody's going to be blessed through you. Right? So God makes these promises to him. And that there's going to be this new family of God, if you will. Now, let's talk about this. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, the Lord said to Abram. When you read Abram's life, God shows up and talks to Abram. How did God speak to Abram? What was that like? Like, really, what was it like? Was he just walking along? Abram, out of the heavens. Yes, Lord. Was it a voice in his head? Was it that, like many of you, have felt God speak into your spirit? Was it a whisper inside? How did God talk to Abram? Well, look at there. Somebody's, somebody's streaming. we got one more viewer. Praise the Lord. You, okay, so you believe that because of his lack of knowledge, God would have spoken audibly. We have all these other ways for God to speak to us. We, okay, anybody else? Yeah. Samuel hears a voice, right? Okay. Moses sees something. Gotcha, gotcha. So if you're watching online, you're missing the conversation right now. Sorry, guys. I get mics out of here. He appeared. So it sounds like it's more than just a voice. All right, that's good. Good stuff. Sounds like we, we've got some, we're paying attention to what we're reading. That's good. Let's move forward. Let's see what we'll see what we see. Verse 7 of chapter 12 says, Then the Lord appeared. I believe it's been in my notes. She looked through my PowerPoint, apparently. <laughs> and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. He appeared. Now, if I say someone appeared, what does that mean? It means you saw them, you, you experienced them with what sense? Eyes, your sight. So it was a visible manifestation of God. All right? Now, it's not the last time that God appears to Abram. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1 says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram. How? In a vision. Now, it's a word in a vision. You understand what I'm saying? It's a word in a vision. Now, watch what happens. He says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Again, the, the, the voice comes in a vision. He says, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So he, who is this he? And he brought him. Who's he? Who's the one bringing in the vision? God and Abram are there. Who's probably the one doing the bringing? God, right? So he brought who? Who did he bring? He brought him. Who's him? So he brought Abram. So this sounds like this is not just a voice. It sounds like somebody's saying, come here, Abram, let's go outside. Now, let's talk about that a little more. Are there any other places? So it seemed to me that God's appearing in somewhat of a way that looks like a man in the Old Testament right here. Maybe. Well, what are some other places that God appeared in the Old Testament? How about as a man or otherwise? Where's God appear as a man in the Old Testament? Anybody? And we'll talk about that a little bit. Abram and Moses, what's the difference? Now, you talked about garden. How do you know he was in bodily form in the garden? Yeah, that, he was walking. Now, somebody could say he's just floating along. It's just anthropomorphic, right? He's not... But here's the problem. How do we know he was a physical being? I'm going to give you the evidence. After they sin, what do they hear? Footsteps. Right? Uh, uh, holograms don't have footsteps. 
He had, taken, he had taken the appearance of man. He comes walking in the garden. Now, so God appears to man in the garden. He appears to, does he ever appear to Abram as a man? Anybody remember that conversation about Lot? Abram's sitting in his tent door. God shows up. Th- three beings show up. One of them's identified as God. Any other place he shows up as a man or in bodily form? Comes to Isaac, Genesis chapter 26. Comes to Jacob. Jacob wrestles. Jacob, Jacob wrestled with who? With God, right? He wrestles with God. Now, what about some other places that he shows up, but maybe we don't see him physically as a man? Somebody said Moses earlier. What do we see there? A burning bush. We're going to talk a little bit more about that burning bush. Yeah, and God shows himself in really more glorified form, really, to Moses on the mountain, where he shield, Moses has to be shielded from him. Uh, what about a voice? Somebody mentioned a voice earlier. Where do we hear the voice of God in the Old Testament? The, Samuel, right? Samuel. Anybody ever heard the voice of God? Samuel, telling you to get up and do something? The other night I heard a voice. Patrick. Thought it was God. It was Heather telling me she heard a noise. I had to get up and check. (laughs) What about, okay, so uh, also we see the word, uh, the word or the voice in Samuel. Then we see the word in Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1 begins like this. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the what came? The word of the Lord came. Now, it's interesting that the word of the Lord comes. Now, people could say, so a voice came to him, or God just tells him what to say. But now look down in verse 9, same interaction. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. So the word, who's also, so it's the word, but he calls him the Lord. The word and the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Two names for the same one, the word and the Lord. The word comes to me, the Lord touches my mouth and says, behold, I put my words in your mouth. So, let's talk about it. The Old Testament is full of these various forms. We've talked about a burning bush. We've talked about like a man to Abram. God taking on these forms. Now we hear the word come and touch Jeremiah. Why does God take on all these different forms when he shows up to man? Because it's just within his ability, right? He's just showing off? No. Why does he do that? What's that? To kind of reinforce the idea that he actually exists? Is that what you mean? Yeah, so if we heard voices, there might be a problem. So that he shows up. Okay, I, I think I understand what you're saying. To reinforce the reality that he is real when he's speaking? That he really told you that. Got you. Got you. Why else would, well, why take this form? Why not just show up in the brightness of his glory? Yeah, we'd be in bad shape, wouldn't we? And so God does this because none of us can see the true essence of God, the true glory presence of God and live. In fact, we know this. You can look through your Bible, whether it's Genesis chapter 32 or in Deuteronomy or in Judges chapter 6. Whenever someone encounters someone that they think is God, they always think that they're going to do what? Die, right? Going to die, right? You know, we come, we come to church and we say, Lord, show us your glory. In the Old Testament, they're saying anything but that. Don't show me your glory, right? Don't show me all of you, right? And so they're, they're, they're coming and, and God shows himself to them in these various ways. Now, let, let's go back for a second. These encounters often include a description of, that doesn't really sound like it's God. For example, with Jacob, what, what do we often hear it called? Jacob, an angel. In fact, we see the angel of the Lord all through the Old Testament. Uh, we talk about the angel of the Lord shows up, and who is it that sees the angel of the Lord? Is it Gideon that sees the angel of the Lord? Whose side are you on? Joshua, one of those leaders, sees the angel of the Lord? That's, I can't believe my mind just slipped on that one. Sees the angel of the Lord. What else? How about the burning bush? 
Now, most of us have probably missed this. We read through it and we don't see it. It's not until we start looking through the Scriptures specifically for the angel of the Lord. Now, when we talk about the burning bush, who do we say was at the burning bush? Who's there? Who's speaking? God, right? God speaking. He says, I am that I am, right? Very simple. Look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So now we've seen God appear as uh, the Word. We've seen God, now we see the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord we see here, we go, okay, wait a second. When I'm reading this, maybe, maybe this is an angel. I want to show you this when you read your Old Testament. Be careful that when you see the angel of the Lord, you don't just think it's an angel that's sent by the Lord. It might be the angel of the Lord. Does that make sense? So, this particular place, the angel of the Lord appears. Moses looks and he sees this burning bush. And then Moses asks a question. The angel of the Lord is there. The angel of the Lord is speaking. Moses says, what's your name? What response does he get? I am that I am. I am. What is I am? I am is the the self-existent God. I am is the God that exists outside of all things. I am. I am without all of this. I am. You can't describe me. I just am. I am. And so he says, I am. Now, the angel of the Lord says, I am. Who is that? Who's I am? Who is the great I am? God. (laughs) We'll go on. Jacob. God appears to Jacob. He had already appeared to him once in Genesis chapter 31, verse 11. The angel of God, the angel of God, see that? The angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, we read this, we think it's just an angel. He says, Jacob, he said, here am I. Now watch what the angel of God says about himself. Next verse, verse 12, you can follow along just to make sure we don't have funny slides up here. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted and mottled, for I've seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land, and return to the land of your kindred. Now, we sometimes have difficulty when we read the Old Testament. Some some scholars don't make this connection between the angel of the God and God. But that just said the angel of God appeared, and then who did he say he was? Now, do you think there's any angels out there besides Satan that would dare to tell that story? He would say, I came from the king. He wouldn't say, I am God. He says, I am the God. So again, we see the angel who calls himself, I am that I am. Right? He says, I am that I am. Now we see the angel who says, I am the God of Bethel. Another place you see God is speaking to Moses about the Israelites. He says, behold, I send an angel before you. He says to do a couple things. Obey his voice or he will not pardon your transgression for my name is in him. Who is this appearance, this angel that's going to lead them? Well, he's got to have authority to forgive sins. Now tell me who has authority to forgive sins. There's only one. Remember, he said, son, your sins be forgiven you. Why did Jesus say that? He was showing his divinity. Because only God can forgive sins. No angel can forgive sins. No angel can determine your rightness with God. Only God himself. And so God says, I'm going to send someone from heaven who's going to go before you, and this one, obey him, and he will pardon your transgression. He says, for my name is in him. Now, name is important. We've seen the angel, name is important because it's an Old Testament way of referring to God or his presence. We see it in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. The name comes burning with his anger. 
Names don't get, names don't have anger, if we're thinking of just a name. And in thick rising smoke, his lips are full of fury. His tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the people a bridle that leads astray. He says, the name of the Lord comes burning with his anger. Even today, did you know that some Jews, some observant Jews, do you know what they call God? Hashem. You know what that means? The name. See, the Old Testament, the angel of God, look at it carefully and it might just be an appearance of God himself. The name of God, look at it, it might just be God himself. Now again, we can know that the angel was God in the human form. We compare Exodus 23 with other places. The angel who met Moses in the burning bush, the angel with God's name inside of him, did bring the Israelites out of the promised land. We see that in Judges. But, but we also see that the Lord did. Deuteronomy says God's own presence did. So the Lord, the presence, the angel, they're all the same names pointing to the same thing. All right, so again, God says if you look at Joshua, it says the Lord brought them out. If you look at Judges, it says the angel with God's name brought them out. You look at Deuteronomy, it says God's presence brought them out. So if we say the Lord, the presence, and the angel, we're all pointing to the same thing, but the angel is a way for the humans to understand when they see this one, the only way they know how to describe him is an angel. We understand that people in that point, did have, they had no clue of God taking on human form. Think about it. I remember a story, you might remember it, about three fellows that find themselves in a pretty hot situation. You remember that? <laughs> and what's the king look down and say? And what does he say he looks like? The son of God in the King James Version, in some versions he looks like a son of the gods. Now it's probably more likely he said a son of the gods because of the idea of that pagan only thinking there was one son of God. But he looks at it and he says, he doesn't look like anything, he looks like he's otherworldly. He didn't understand it. He didn't get it. He couldn't get his mind around it. Again, so we see this angel. The only thing they could think of is angelic beings, things they cannot describe. Now we see another place of the alignment of the angel of God and God himself. This one comes from the deathbed of Jacob. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 48, Jacob is dying and he wants to bless the household of Joseph. It says, and he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked... The God who has been my shepherd all my life, long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the boys. Now he describes them all these ways and then asks for his blessing. Now who's the redeemer? Jesus is the redeemer. Jesus. When you see these in the Old Testament, you're seeing what's called a theophany, which is an appearance of God. Got a couple of my old Bible school students back here. We might have talked about that in Bible class. I don't know. Did you guys? Did we teach you guys? Uh, Behold our God. Did we teach that to you guys? I don't know if we did. I don't know if I was your teacher for that class. But anyway, we did. We we, we taught this class to, to students. We had theophany, theos and appearance, theophany, the appearance of God. In this case, we can call it a Christophany, the appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. But a theophany is appearance of God. Now notice this. He connects God with the angel. The angel's the redeemer and then the redeemer is a singular blessing. So now we arrive at the question. We've seen a few descriptors. We've seen him called angel. We've seen him called word. We've seen him called name. Where have we heard those before? In the New Testament. And in the New Testament, who do they refer to? We talk about the word. Who's the word? Right? Jesus, Jesus, who, who, is, who is this one there? Let's look at it. John chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So here we see the Word, in the beginning was the Word, who's the Word? Jesus, the Logos, and the Word was with God. That's, we, could have, we could have some Trinitarian teaching right there, with, literally translated face to face. The Word was God, He is God. Now, how do we know for sure that this is Jesus? Let's look down at verse 14 of John chapter 14, of John chapter 1. And the Word did what? Became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So now we see this one. What separates him? Somebody not long ago in one of our other classes said, hey, you see this term sons of God. What separates Jesus from the rest of them? Because he's the only one that comes from 
the Father, proceeding from the Father, carrying out the mission of the Father, the only one that is God the Son. So we see him here. In fact, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, we talked about it. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire, right? So he says, how do we know it's not just an angel? How do we know it's not the angel and then God shows up to talk? Look at Jude chapter 5. Or not Jude chapter 5. There's only one chapter in Jude. Look at Jude 5. That always throws me off. Jude 5, one chapter, fifth verse. Jude 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. The angel was Jesus. The angel was God showing in human form. Who is it that's this pillar of fire? It's Jesus. Who is it that's separating the sea and then crushing the enemy? It's Jesus. It's God's presence that makes this angel different from all the others that are called angels. This is the one that comes as the name of God. Watch how Jesus prays in Gethsemane. John chapter 17 and verse 5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. In case someone says Jesus is created being, here you go. Before there was a world, it was you and I, Father, and I knew you in a glory that was beyond this world. Glorify me in that presence. And now watch what he says in the next verse. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. I manifested your name. Whose name? God's name. What does he mean? He's not saying, is Jesus saying, hey, I came and told everybody what your name was? Go ahead, guys. Guess what his name is? No, Jesus, who are, what religion are most of Jesus' followers? Jews. Do they know what God's name is? Yeah. They know he's Yahweh. They know who he is. They had the Old Testament. They could have looked up God's name in a thousand different verses. They could have looked up multiple names of God, multiple descriptors of God. When he says, I manifested your name, he's saying, I showed them who you are. I was God before their very eyes. I was your essence, your name made flesh. I showed them. Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. Right? So we, and in the New Testament, we're okay with that. We get that. Now, any, anybody tonight see any of those old verses from the Old Testament a little differently than you did before? Now that you see Jesus there. Sure. Sure. It's the logical extension. that It's God in flesh. God in appearing to man. So now we get to the important question of the night. We don't want to just leave here saying, oh, that's really cool. You told us a bunch of things that refer to Jesus. Let's go to the house. Why does it matter? Why does this matter? Well, it lays out the way that we have to view the spiritual world. It lays out this understanding that every Bible story you've ever read takes place within the bigger story of this spiritual conflict that we keep talking. Can I tell you something? Today, church, there was spiritual war in Washington, D.C. There is every day, but today, I, I had some friends that were leading prayer in D.C. today. I had some friends that went up. To, in fact, I was asked about going up, but we had a scheduling conflict, and I couldn't do it to be outside the Supreme Court today. Recently, there were some, some folks from another church that many people here have been to that church that went up during the confirmation hearings of one of the justices. During that confirmation hearing, I don't know if you remember this or not, but they had to stop the hearing. First time in history they had to stop the hearing because of the noise, people screaming, banging on the doors. Never has it had to happen. You remember there was an uproar about this particular justice's confirmation not long ago. When they went up there to pray during these confirmation hearings, Literally, this was a school group from a, from a Pentecostal school group. They went up there to pray, took their kids up to pray outside the Supreme Court. They encountered groups of witches putting curses and hexes upon the Supreme Court, upon 
that upon Justice Kavanaugh. Specifically praying to, to satanic entities to stop him from being put in place. Why did they want to stop that? Because of abortion. Because there was fear that abortion would be stopped. Now, people say that's political. It's not political. I don't care how many politicians talk about abortion. They'll never make it political. It's always a moral issue. If next week somebody comes out and says, I'm running for office and murder is the point of my, my, my campaign, that doesn't make it a political issue. It's a moral issue. So stop, listen, don't let anybody tell you abortion is political. It's not. Politicians, the fact that politicians are speaking about morality is just because Christians have failed to do so. And so now... We live in a world where we see that spiritual conflict. That's, that is war that is going on. We look at that and we go, how does that weigh out in the Old Testament? That means that everything that happened, happened in the light of this conflict. And this isn't some Marvel Universe movie. <laughs> this isn't Clash of the Titans. It's not some legend. This is real spiritual warfare. And the God we serve has real enemies. And you and I have real spiritual enemies. There's an enemy that wants to destroy your children, that wants to destroy your marriage, wants to destroy your finances, that wants to destroy everything about you that he can. There are these created beings that were once loyal to God, but they went their own way. These are the rebel gods that Paul describes as dark powers, rulers, authorities, the principalities of this world. And here's the thing. They didn't go away. That you can't find the verse that says that they just... And then John wrote Revelation and all the principalities went home. <laughs> They're going somewhere. They're still here. And that's the thing we have to understand. Why in our land today are we in such a conflict about identity? Because we were created in the image of God. That's why. That's why that matters. Why do we see rampant suicide? Because Satan hates those that are created in the image of God. Why do we see so much conflict and hatred and anger and all the things that we see because we are in spiritual war. And you can go down through the ages and you can see all the things and you can talk about all the stories that happened in all the cultures and all the areas that spiritual war went one way or another. But nonetheless, we are in spiritual war. And the thing is, these enemies, they have one goal. And that is to do what? Does anybody know what their goal is? What's their ultimate goal now on earth? Steal, kill, destroy. To separate us from God. They want nothing. They don't care about us. They want to deprive God from reuniting with us. That's what they want. They want to do anything they can to stop that. And so out of that, we see that there are particular powers. The one that we call Satan, but he's not the only one. He's not the only thing that's... In fact, most of us will never encounter Satan. It's a simple math problem. Seven billion people on the face of the earth, Satan's not omnipresent. All right? To say that Satan can be everywhere is not true. He's not God. He doesn't know everything. He can't be everywhere. That's another reason why it's important to be careful of the things you say. 100%. The powers of the air can hear what you say. They don't know what you think. They can only invade your thought. They don't know what you think, but they, they can know what you whisper in your spirit. You can speak spiritually, if you will. But why, do, why does God give us the spirit, the angelic spirit of praying in tongues? Praying with groanings that can't... Spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with God. But it's not just to confound the enemy. We also have to understand, we've got to be careful. When I say things, I could, be, I could begin to feel something. Have you ever noticed that when you begin to get emotional, the things you're thinking will begin to come out of your mouth? 
Your flesh is tricking you. What is your flesh tricking you into doing? Your flesh, why does your flesh want to trick you? Because your flesh is doomed to destruction. See, we're getting to the last 20 minutes. We're about to really teach now. Your flesh is doomed to destruction. Your flesh is going to be, what's going to happen? Your mortal is going to put on what? Immortality. This flesh will not survive. Most of us are going to die. We're going to be buried. And this flesh is going to rot away. And you are going to become fertilizer from, for daisies somewhere. That's what's going to happen, right? If you're really crunchy, you might like give your body to one of those places that will bury you like with a tree or something like that. And then you can give life to the, you know, whatever. Whatever it is you want to do. If that's what you want to do, God bless you. But I'm going to tell you what, if you're one of those people... I'm probably not going to come get shade under your tree. I'm just going to tell you that's creepy. I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But here's the thing. Your flesh is doomed to destruction. Your spirit's going to live forever. Your flesh is going to die. So your flesh will trick you. The spirit's willing. The flesh is weak. Now, it doesn't mean that the flesh is necessarily evil. The flesh, you can see glorified flesh, but this body that you're in, this flesh is bent toward destruction. So what happens is you begin to get emotional and all of a sudden things begin to come out of your mouth. Now who knows what your weakness is? I got to, you know, think about it. You say things like, I just, I don't, I could just take my own life. All of a sudden. I, I, I don't know why they treat me like that. I, I, I've got half a mind to tell them what I think. All of a sudden, boom, anger begins to show up. Things begin to whisper. I don't even know why I ever married them. All of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Things begin to show up. The enemy begins to come. I can't, I don't, you know what? I, church doesn't help me anyway. 17 excuses begin to show up. Why, why you don't want me? We begin to speak things. When we speak, what happens? I'm not saying you have creative power. Only God has creative power. But what you do have is the power of literally speaking. I don't believe in the law of attraction, but I believe if you tell the enemy what your weakness is, he's going to show up where that weakness is. If there's an enemy of our soul, there's an enemy out there, and we go, hey, the back door's unlocked. Guess where the enemy might show up, right? And so now this enemy has come, Satan has come, and Satan wants to destroy us. And here's the thing. What was his goal? His goal was to separate us from eternal life. And he did it. He won his first, the first battle he won in the garden, we lost. We were separated. Now, Yahweh's creation is going to die. Kick me out of your heaven, Satan says. Kick me out of your heaven. I'll destroy your beloved creation. And so now what happens? We see that they want to destroy God's people. Again, what happens? God's people come to Canaan. They show up there. There's a bunch of these other gods. We talked about There's a, these other gods people are worshiping. We talked about the Nephilim, these, 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 these offspring of these angelic beings, all these things. We talk about that. And they have one goal in mind. When they see God's people, what are we going to do to them? Kill them. Kill them all. And so they set out to kill God's people. Kill them, or we're going to be killed by them, but we're going to do everything we can to stop them from possessing the land that God has promised. Israel overcomes in the war, and they get into the land, and now the people can't overcome them by strength. So the enemy strategy changes. I can't kill them. So what can I do? How can I separate them from their God if I cannot kill them? What's he do then? After the Israelites get to the promised land, what do we begin to see a cycle of? What's that? Id idolatry. Idol worship. They bring in these other people, and they begin to have again and again. So now these other gods say, the people that follow me aren't powerful enough to kill them, but what if I can just draw them away from him? And they begin to seduce God's people into worshiping other gods. And you know what the plan is? We'll get them away from us. We'll rid us of the stench of Jehovah worship in our land. Because if we can get them to worship other gods, then God will take care of them for us. 
Did it work? Well, it did. How did it work? They started worshiping other gods. What did God do to his people? Put them in exile, in enslavement. Move them out of the promised land into a place of exile. God sent them away. But see, now there, there's another problem. Now they've got them out of that land. But God has a plan that's going to redeem his people. And the plan includes the angel, the name, the God that appeared all the way through the story. He doesn't just show up in the, Old, in the New Testament. That's the important thing you've got to understand. He is the God of the remnant all the way through. It wasn't like God was like, well, everything else didn't work. Let me try Jesus. No, that was always the plan. It was always Jesus. God wasn't going to give up. And the curse had already been foretold that one day what was going to happen? What happened? Let's go back to the garden. You're going to be crushed. You're going to bruise his heel. But he's going to crush your head. One day there was going to be a descendant of Eve. One day there's going to be one. And they had no idea. Think about it. God appears as the angel of the Lord. God appears as a burning bush. God appears as a flaming pillar of fire. God appears as a cloud by day. God appears in all these powerful ways. And the enemy thinks if he ever comes for us, he's coming like that. But the promise had been that he would come as a descendant of Eve. And here we are in the Advent season. And God says, I'm going to show up as a baby. <laughs> and they, they knew something was up, but they didn't know what the plan was. And they figured out maybe it's a baby. How do we know that? Remember what happened. Kill all the babies. Kill all the babies. Not the first time. They thought that was happening all the way back with Moses. Kill all the babies. In the promised land, put... Let them put their babies in the fires of Molech. Kill the babies. Kill the babies. Why? Because God's plan works in lesser beings. Why do you think, again, and I hate that we keep going back to it today, why do we see the call to kill the babies in our land? Why is that? Why do we have people that stand up and say that is part of liberty, the right to kill a baby? Why is that? Because when we kill the next generation, we kill those that are here to cooperate with God's plan. The enemy knows that. He doesn't know what the, who the where, he doesn't know where the next Billy Graham's coming from. He's not God. He doesn't know where, where, where the next prophet's coming out. He's not God. He doesn't know where the next revivalist is coming from. So he knows is I hate them all. And the easiest way to get them right now. Get them right now. And here's the thing: they didn't know what God's plan was. They try to kill the babies. You got the wise men. The king says, come back by here. They say, no, they go a different way. Jesus ends up, his parents have to flee to save his life. All those things happen then throughout his life. There's various plots against him and so on and so forth. But they didn't know that the plan was a cross. In fact, they thought that they were stopping God's plan. We know that because the scripture says, had the rulers of this world known, they wouldn't have done it. If they had known crucifixion was the plan, they wouldn't have crucified him. They couldn't understand why dying for them, that didn't make sense to them. The plan was a mystery. Here we see in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here we are in this kind of strange series to be going into the Christmas season. But I think we see the most beautiful thing when we understand that this baby was an invasion. It was an invasion. The pillar, the fire, the angel of God, the name of God, the Word who's going to take on flesh. And He doesn't come. He doesn't come. Yeah, He does a lot of kind, wonderful, sweet, Things, things that make us venerate his just wonderful nature, but he comes as an act of war to destroy the enemy of our souls, 
to set us free once and for all. And now we see, and we're going to go forward and talk about some of this more in depth in the weeks ahead, but now we see that true victory comes through Christ. But this isn't the first time that victory came through Christ. In the wilderness, when Moses sees the burning bush, it comes through Christ. Coming out of Egypt, it came through Christ. When Jeremiah has the word appear, it came through Christ. In the book of Daniel, when there's a fourth man in the fire, it came through Christ. It's always been Jesus. So we're going to close with a couple questions, and then we'll pray. I want to ask you a couple things, and actually these questions come from a book. If you want to check some of this out, there's a book called excuse me, it's called Supernatural. There's a book that's a study guide for Supernatural. These questions actually come out of the study guide, so it's called a Supernatural Study Guide. Uh, To hear Ephesians 2 and 2 tell it, Satan currently has authority in our world. Do we have any evidence that it's true that Satan has authority in our world, or is that just something we accept on faith? Can you point at anything around you and say, yeah, I think that makes sense that Satan has authority in our world? Abortion? What else? The murder, the evil, the wickedness? Sure. Anything else? The identity crisis? 100%. Anything else? Those are some good answers. Now, does, and maybe this is kind of an open-ended question, seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, Does that change your understanding of any of the Old Testament stories or your understanding of Jesus? And if it does, how so? Somebody talk to me. Anybody? I'll give you an example. For me, when I see Jesus in the Old Testament, it changes the idea that the Old Testament God was a God of wrath and Jesus is like the kind God that shows up to like stop the God of wrath from getting us all. Does that make sense? Like Jesus, what, when God was raining down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus wasn't over in the corner wringing his hands going like, what have you done? Why are you doing this? No, Jesus was involved. When the order went out to kill men, women, and children in Canaan, Jesus is the one that's involved. God the Father, God the Son aren't in conflict. It's only Christ's flesh nature on earth that ever has a problem with following the will of God not Christ's divine nature. It doesn't have a problem. I think that changes sometimes because we treat Jesus, the world around us treats Jesus like he's this, like he's a, like he's a hippie, I think, like he's just a nice guy who's just here to be like, hey, everybody, let's get along. It's all good. Like, like he's just the essence of something that he's not. He's, Jesus is pure, holy God who's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's a God who will forgive you, but he's also a God who will destroy the rebellious. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who shows up to the angel of the Lord, and they say, whose side are you on? He's not on anybody's side. I've got the host of the Lord. That's who I am. <laughs> I am the side. You understand what I'm saying? It changes our perception sometimes when we understand. I think seeing Jesus like this breaks the line between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not two different stories. It's one long narrative that is a spiritual war of which we see The victory won right there in the Gospels, right? That's where the victory is won, and now we live in that victory. But it's not like it's a new story. Anybody else on that subject at all about seeing Jesus viewing the God of the Old Testament? Anybody ever struggle? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Absolutely. He is the one, right. All things created by him, for him, through him. That, the other thing I think that's important there is it actually helps us throw off some heresies as well. For example, uh, Arianism or modalism or oneness theory, like which tells us that, that Jesus is just another appearance of God. Well, when we see them operating in this way, we can understand that it's not just God in different manifestations, it is God the Father and God the Son. It's also important when we see Jesus in the Old Testament, we can understand something like Mormonism, which believes that Jesus was just a thought in the mind of God. He always existed, but he existed as a thought until the point of his conception. 
Well, the Bible plainly shows that's not the case. So that's just another way when we understand this, we understand God better, we can push back against heresy a little better. Now, here's another question, and this kind of goes back to last week we talked about these other gods. How do we often define idols in our day and time? Like material, that's like our number one go-to, isn't it? Things, right? Um, why do you think it is that idols have become identified as cars, boats, money, houses, whatever? Why do you think we've identified idols that way? Yeah. Do you think that there's something more to it than that? Than just those things? Is the car really the idol? Who are they actually worshiping? Selves. Right? They're rebelling. Who does that remind you of? Satan. I want some glory from me. Humanism. Yeah, and you'll see a lot of that. Uh, recently, we, we, uh, there was one that was very close to here that uh, basically there was a, a pastor that made a statement that he took down after about a day or two, but it got out cry everywhere, but a very large church. And the pastor made the statement that uh, Jesus, when he comes into your life, he doesn't change you. He just makes you, you know, he just reveals the good you that's always been there. Well, that's about as anti-gospel as anything I've ever heard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I, at the end of the day, though, I don't necessarily just condemn those things. I try not to because if you're not careful, you understand anybody that talks a lot, they're going to eventually say something that anybody can pick apart. So I try to give grace in those things. That being said, yeah, there's a lot of thought in that. Live your best life now. You've got it in you. Just let Jesus, you know. He's just here to help you release the better you. Like Jesus is our, is our guru, Right? We're worshiping ourselves, which is really satanic, right? Saying, I want some of the glory. There's also some other things we could be worshiping. There's other gods that are out there. there there's other entities that we could be trying to appease, whether it's the pridefulness, whether it's... But the, I, I would say that there are spiritual things out there. These are not just... It's not just a matter of me worshiping me. There are these spiritual things that are whispering to us. The thing about it is, in our land... Satan has the upper hand because we like worshiping ourselves. A lot of lands, they like to worship something. In America, we, we're okay with, hey, you don't have to give us a God. We'll just worship ourselves. Just tell me what I need to do to let everybody know how awesome I am, right? So, we better leave that one alone. We'll have everybody too convicted to come to church on Sunday. Now, let me ask you one more question. Uh, well, I've got two more here. So we've talked about cosmic geography. We've talked about spirituality in certain places. All right? Talked about that, whether I told you about the, the story of the, the colonel who talked about warfare. I talked about people that have been in different places in the world and felt different things. You can go certain places in the world right now that are known for, like, trafficking children. It's disgusting, the things that happen. It's strange that they happen in particular places. You go to other places and there's voodoo and things like that. There's the legends that go along with the story of Haiti. Anybody ever heard the story of Haiti and the idea that overthrowing the slave masters included a voodoo ceremony in which they said, we'll give our souls in the island to Satan. And there's a lot of Haitian Christians that believe that, that Haiti is under bondage because of the voodoo that was there. I, I mean, there, there, we know that these things are real, you know, and you go back far enough in some of our cultures and we can see a lot of that thing, the witchcraft and so on and so forth that's there. Some of you that grew up with Appalachian culture, you've heard of people doing things like divining, you've heard of people talking to fire and all that stuff that uh, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, some of you may though know about getting burns and going to somebody that could talk to it and draw the fire out and all those things and a lot, a lot of the things that are out there and the thing about it is it's not scary because it doesn't work, it's scary because it does, right? Sure. And a lot of idolatry in those places as well. And and you go on and you see the, the greed and the viciousness that happens in a lot of our cities. You see um, people who have been involved in drugs will know about the spirituality. Why do these things so often connect 
with demon possession? Why do so many things run hand in hand? That would bring us to something else. We just came out of the uh, October season. Does anybody ever, does, does any, did any of this when we talked about locations of spirituality make anybody think twice about haunted houses and haunted places? Is it possible that spirits dwell in a location? Now here's the thing, it's possible, but I'll tell you what it's not. It's not the spirit of your grandma. It's not the spirit of your uncle. It's not the spirit of a dead Civil War soldier. That's not what it is. Everybody that dies has gone to a holding place for judgment. But there could be spirits in a place. Yes, ma'am. Or was it? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh -huh. no, there there are certainly no doubt places where there are certain spiritual things that happen. There are cities that have certain strongholds. I believe that with everything within me. That you go to certain places and have but now here's the thing, you go to one of these places, you feel like there's spiritual things happening. We're not pagans. We don't believe in we don't go in and say well, I mean, what do we do to combat these things? First of all, what do we not do? Well, what we don't do is we don't go in and go, I, if, I take a, if I take a cross with me, I'll be all right. You might as well carry a stick. We're not pagans. We don't fight spiritual things with physical items, right? We're not going to go in and sprinkle some water around. We're not even, now we believe in anointing with oil, but oil doesn't do it. Does that make sense? It's not the oil. It's not, we don't have, God doesn't possess the oil. It is a mark saying we believe that we are saying that God's presence is here. We are making a physical motion, a physical thing to be a representation of God's presence and God's power and God's authority. We are following after biblical precedent, but we're not saying, hey, well, if I, put this, if I put this oil in the mark of the cross, if I lay this Bible in front of my door, Right? There's people that'll leave a Bible open in their house and cuss each other out all the time. There's no peace in this house. Read it. Don't just leave it open. Right? It's open. It's got two inches of dust where it's been open, but it's open. Right? We're not pagans. We don't can, but we can walk in the, in the spiritual authority of Christ. This is a conversation that I have with my daughters. We're, we're covered by the blood. I'm not afraid of demons. I don't say that because I want to be challenged by demons. I don't want to go home tonight... I don't want to go home tonight and have a fight with, with demons or principalities and powers, but I'm not afraid of them. Because I'm, why, why am I not afraid of them? It's because I'm ignorant. It's because I'm washed in the blood. It's because I'm sealed to the day of redemption. It's because I'm his property. Does that make sense? And we're going to be in spiritual warfare. We're going to be in spiritual warfare like we've never been in before. If we're going to talk about, I, I actually, I, I had someone, and I, I will tell you, I'll just be very open and honest with you. I had someone who said, Pastor, you shouldn't talk about abortion. I literally had someone tell me that. I'm a long, long time member of Garden Sanctuary. You shouldn't talk about abortion. I said, why not? They said, you're going to attract negative attention for the church. So ho hold on a second. We shouldn't talk about abortion. Well, I'm not going to stop talking about abortion in case anybody wants to know. I'm not going to stop talking about it. There are people that are so afraid of spiritual conflict that we won't stand for truth. There are people that are so scared of dealing with that. There are people that, let, let's not pray for deliverance because we're afraid that's going to attract the fight of the enemy. That's going to attract the enemy and he's going to fight us. He is, 100%. But I still believe that God delivers. I still believe that there are people walking around that are dealing with things that need to be set free. I still believe there are Christians. There are probably people in this room right now that are fighting with things that you're not possessed, but you need deliverance. What does that mean? That means you're surrounded by an oppressing enemy. Deliverance is breaking through a surrounding enemy. And so a lot of times as believers, we've only thought that we needed spiritual breakthrough when someone was possessed. And we thought, well, I'm a Christian. I can't be possessed. 
Possession imp- implies that you're owned. You might not be possessed, but there might be somebody, there might be an enemy that's trespassing. Does that make sense? There might be depression, a spirit. So it might be chemical and it might be a spirit. And here's the thing. I cannot cast out what needs to be counseled, what needs to be counseled out. That's the facts. Sometimes we try to cast things out and people really need some counseling. And that's okay. Sometimes we try to pray things out and we would never tell somebody don't go see, we'll tell somebody don't go see a psychiatrist, but we'd never say don't go see the, the doctor about your diabetes. You might have a chemical issue that you need to go see a doctor. And God can heal that, but it's physical. That's not spiritual. Does that make sense? If your brain is producing a different level of serotonin or dopamine or whatever it is, that is not a spiritual attack. That is a physical thing. Now, God can heal that, but that's not a matter of deliverance. Does that make sense? Everybody follow me. I don't want to go too long. I've already gone too long. But there are also people who are under spiritual attack. And there's not anything chemically wrong. You're under spiritual attack. There's also families that are under spiritual attack. There's people that are dealing with things that they are oppressed. And hopefully what we're beginning to see now is that this has been the enemy's plan since the beginning. None of these stories are absent of the enemy, but also none of these stories are absent of our Redeemer. And that's the point. So whatever you're dealing with, whether it's a belie- whether you're a believer that is, I want to talk to believers, really. If you're not a believer, you need to come to Christ and watch him begin to set you free and set you free. But I'm talking about believers who are dealing with things, dealing with spiritual attacks against your family, against your children, against yourself. You need to understand that it might be an addiction that you struggle with. And you say, I don't know how to get rid of this thing. I don't know how to do this. I can't do it. You can't. But God can, through Christ. It might be a thing relationally. It might be a thing that happened to you in your past and it's just carried on. All those things. Every story includes the enemy. And every day of your life, again, I want to be careful. If you never change your tires, you will have flat tires and that won't be Satan that did it. All right? If you never fix your washing machine, eventually it's going to break. If you never take care, it's going to break. When the belt breaks on your dryer, that's not the devil. It's 12 years old. That's what that is. All right? Does that make sense? But every day of your life, there's an enemy that's after you. Every single one of our children, the enemy's after. I think our kids are out on the tree lot tonight. Every single one of our young people, Satan wants to destroy. Every marriage in this room and in this church, Satan wants to destroy. That's why it's so powerful. These ladies that come in here and pray on Sunday morning, that's as powerful as any practice and as any preparation for preaching as possible because people walk in this room and there's an enemy that goes to war with them. And that's what this is about. Every day of your life includes the enemy, but every day of your life includes the Redeemer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for this chance to learn of you. We pray that your hand would be upon us, that you guide and touch and teach us. Lord, we pray that you help us to understand that we are in a spiritual war, but that victory has been won. And we can dwell in that victory named Jesus. Father, I pray you'd help us all to walk from this place understanding that you are the deliverer from every attack of the enemy. Let us recognize that every day of our life we face an enemy, but every day of our life greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And Lord, we know that in this world are powers and principalities and and rulers in high places. That's what's in this world, but greater is he that is in us. Father, I pray you'd help us to walk in that. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. God bless you as you go. I apologize for keeping you a little bit longer than I like to, but somebody said, Pastor, we get out at the same time. You say that every week. Maybe, but y'all leave me alone. God bless you.